Welcome all the people that are worshiping with us at home, and we hope that you stay well. I have special news this morning for anyone who hasn't heard. Elaine Ardia was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer, and she had an operation this week and is cancer-free. I also want to welcome any visitors. I see Nina Schlikens here. Very happy to see you. I want to thank Dan Dion for taking care of the sound and Dave Hansen for being our videographer. A special thank you for Lorna for filling in with her musical contributions. And I want to thank everyone for following the protocols that we all really don't want, but we have to wear the masks and stay six feet apart. Hopefully we can leave it on the whole time. I want you to read your bulletin. There is an open house for Eric and Linda Johnston on August 22nd, 12 to 3. Bring a chair and something to eat and have a good time. We're going to miss you, Linda. We want to thank Carolyn Eames this morning, who's provided the flowers once again. Please rise as we have our invocation in the Lord's Prayer. Please, Lord, bless all of our leaders. Bless especially those who are close to us here at church and in Lewiston Auburn. Bless the school leaders and all those who have to make tough decisions. Bless all of our medical heroes. Bless our congregation, our search committee, Pastor Jim. Bless members in our church who are suffering or grieving a recent loss. Please bless all of our silent prayers. Please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated and take your insert for our opening songs, Great is the Lord and How Majestic is Your Name. Great is the Lord, he is holy and just. By his power we trust in his love. Great is the Lord, he is faithful and true. By his mercy he proves he is love. Great is the Lord and worthy of glory. Great is the Lord, and worthy of praise. Great is the Lord, now lift up your voice, now lift up your voice. Great is the Lord, great is the Lord. Great is the Lord, and worthy of glory. Great is the Lord, and worthy of praise. Great is the Lord, now lift up your voice, now lift up your voice. Great is the Lord. Great is the Lord. Great are you, Lord, and worthy of glory. Great are you, Lord, and worthy of praise. Great are you, Lord, I lift up my voice, I lift up my voice. Great 
are you Lord great are you Lord oh Lord our Lord How majestic is your name in all the earth. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. O Lord, we praise your name. O Lord, We magnify your name, Prince of Peace, mighty God, O Lord God Almighty. I was waxing nostalgic yesterday. Um, We found out uh, this last Sunday that... uh, Uh, last Sunday, the church that we came from, uh, Discover Church in Camp Hill, Pennsylvania, uh, where we had served 20 years and have many friends there, and we're enjoying our new friendships here. But we still get scuttlebutt, you know, from what's going on back there. And so uh, they had a candidate last Sunday. And uh, tomorrow, I understand that the uh, Board of Elders will be meeting to decide if they're going to extend him a call. But over the years, um, we didn't have as many piano players at Discover Church that were uh, competent. We had a, just a couple, and the ones we had weren't comfortable with the choruses. So when we, uh, when we did our chorus package, we sang four or five choruses somewhere in the middle of the service, and we had a couple of hymns also, uh, and, and it, a lot of it's the same music that you're used to hearing here, but uh, I would end up playing the piano for those choruses because there's syncopations and things that our regular pianist wasn't comfortable with. So what I want to do today is just uh, give you a package of choruses and play three or four of them. Uh, and uh, I've dog-eared some of the pages here, so I'm not even sure which ones I'll play. But uh, some of them you may know and some you may not know. You have a book very, fam- very similar to this downstairs in the vestry, so I know you know some of these, and uh, probably some of you will know all of them. So I'm just playing for fun and pretending you're not here.
Do you know All Hail King Jesus? Have you heard that one? So I found, like the hymn book, when you page through 300 and some pages of a chorus book, you probably use the same 50 all the time. And there's about 250 that go to waste. So sometimes you run across some real gems. This one was called, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord of Hosts. Two more. You know this one. Shine, Jesus, shine.
uh, change the scripture that I was going to read. I'll read it later during the message, but I want to go to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. And I'm reading uh, what the Apostle John wrote in Revelation 1 in his vision of Jesus walking among the seven churches. John 1 verse 9, or uh, Revelation 1 verse 9. This is John's vision of Jesus Christ glorified. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet which said, Write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to, down to his feet and with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like a blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. And now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Will you stand with me as we pray? Our Father and our God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is pictured here and written down so carefully by the Apostle John, We recognize that even the Apostle writing in his most eloquent language cannot express what he sees. And what he sees is the glorified Christ. And we recognize that the flannel graph picture of Jesus that we see in our hearts and in our minds is not the whole picture of the God who came and indwelt a body of flesh. God in the flesh, our Lord Jesus Christ, is vast and has every power and every glory conceivable, and every power and every glory inconceivable. And we praise him this day, and we've gathered in his name And we pray that the blessed Holy Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, would indwell our hearts and our brains as we try to uh, focus and worship and give you praise and honor in a way that would approximate something that would be pleasing to you. We know we're very inadequate to do it. Lord, we pray that you would give us something special in our power to praise you and please you and give us something to take home with us and to give away as well uh, today in this service. We pray for those who are traveling, those who are away. Some are ministering in other churches today. And Lord, uh, some simply can't come out because they're not well. And Lord, we pray that you would uh, give a touch to those that aren't well, that are connected to us, in our families and in in our church family, in our extended family of every kind. We pray 
that you would be a God of healing and a God of power, a God of encouragement to those who need it today. Those of us who came here uh, perhaps depressed or defeated or having come through a week where we've faced uh, new fears, Father, I pray that you would dissipate those fears, that you would uh, erase that depression, that you would give us the power of the children of God as we worship here together. Lord, I pray for Mike as he uh, leads worship up here and uh, the folks that are standing at the doors and ushering people in and out, the ones that hand out bulletins and clean the church and fix the uh, uh, electronics and run uh, the program. Lord, we, we appreciate everyone who does anything uh, as part of the ministry of this church. And we pray that you would help us to do all of those things with more excellence. And Lord, now uh, as we are conducting what we call a worship service, uh, may our worship truly be in service of you and your kingdom. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please take your insert for the hymn, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like flowers before thee, opening to the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark of doubt away. Giver of immortal gladness, fill us with the light of day. All thy works with joy surround thee, earth and heaven reflect thy rays. Stars and angels sing around thee, center of unbroken praise. Field and forest, vale and mountain, flowery meadow, flashing sea, chanting bird and flowing fountain, call us to rejoice in Thee. Thou art giving and forgiving, ever blessing, ever blessed, wellspring of the joy of living, ocean depth of happy rest. Thou our Father, Christ our brother, all who live in love are thine. Teach us how to love each other, lift us to the joy divine. Mortals join the mighty chorus which the morning stars began. Father, love is reigning o'er us. Brother, love binds man to man. Ever singing, march we onward, victors in the midst of strife. Joyful music lifts us onward in the triumph song of life. Masks are miserable, aren't they? I was thinking that when I came here, I said to someone on the way in here, I'll be so glad when this is over. Thank you all for complying so well 
And uh, the only reason Mike and I don't use them when we're talking is because uh, we wouldn't be able to think. There wouldn't be enough oxygen, you know, uh, to the brain. But uh, someone has already observed that with the sermon title called Windstorms and Lightning, that there's probably one or more science teachers in the room that could lecture uh, this morning if we were talking about weather. But uh, it's really kind of a different direction that we're going. Uh, We're not that many weeks from uh, the events of Palm Sunday and the week of Passion and uh, Easter Sunday and and even the Ascension. And uh, when we consider back to those events, uh, we are very much involved in... uh, a study of what Jesus Christ did for us emotionally and physically as a human being. He was literally and physically nailed to a cross the night before he prayed to his father in deep emotion that if possible the the cup would pass from him. He came to understand uh, at at the event that we call the Last Supper. Uh, He didn't come to understand it then, but he had the fact of Judas's betrayal. Uh, Someone who had followed him and been part of the ministry, uh, and uh, that always raises uh, questions for me. How did Judas fly under the radar for three years or four years as he followed Jesus? He didn't fly under Jesus' radar. Jesus knew who he was and what he was about, but what took place in the heart and mind of Judas? Well, that's another sermon. Um, God came to us in the flesh. And when we say that, that is an astounding statement. We believe it. It's part of our orthodox Christianity. God somehow, in some divine capacity of his, condensed himself, brought himself uh, into the body of a baby who would be born in the normal way that babies are born, but who would not be conceived in the normal way babies are conceived, who would be brought into the world, who would be born sinlessly, the first man born sinlessly since Adam. And all that is God would be in Jesus, the man. A human-looking Jesus is easy for us to embrace. We, uh, if we've grown up in the church, we have a, a Sunday school paper picture, we have a flannel graph picture, Almost all of us are old enough to remember flannel graph, right? We still have some upstairs. And uh, in fact, we have some very nice flannel graph upstairs. And in fact, they're still making it. If you want a a nostalgia thing and you want to buy a set of flannel graphs for at home, you can still get some. But uh, we have this flannel graph picture of Jesus. And um, he's uh, very human looking in those pictures. And... It's easy to think about embracing a human-looking Jesus. Uh, He's easy to relate to. But what is Jesus like? What does he look like? What does he sound like? What is his presence like in his Godhead? And when we talk about Godhead, where it's a theological term, we're simply talking about everything that comes together to make up God. And in the book of Colossians, uh, it tells us in the first chapter, it tells us again in the second chapter, that in Him, in Jesus Christ, was all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Everything that is God was in Jesus Christ. How does a God that fills the universe confine Himself to a man's body? Many of the prophets of God saw a vision, no doubt limited in scope, uh, a a vision of God in his majesty and in his glory. But if Jesus is God, and he is, then all the fullness of the God 
glories were fit miraculously into Christ's physical person. Colossians 1.19, Colossians 2.9, John 1.14, the Word became flesh. These verses uh, all point to that confinement in Jesus Christ, the human person of everything that is God. How can a God who dwells here and also at the extent of his universe, if his universe has an extent, how can that God confine himself into a human being? Ezekiel was a prophet and a priest of Israel who ministered to his countrymen as they were captives of Nebuchadnezzar, who was their host. They did not wish to accept the invitation, but he was their host nevertheless. He invaded Jerusalem twice. Uh, The the main invasion was in 586 B.C. And Nebuchadnezzar took away all of the competent Jews that that had skills, that were professionals, uh, that were educated. He took away the young princes. That's how Daniel and his friends, uh, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, also known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that's how they all got there. And Ezekiel was a prophet contemporary with Daniel. He was a prophet to the captives in Babylon. Jeremiah was a contemporary prophet who was a prophet back home with those who were left in Judah. And Daniel, of course, uh, served the kings. So there are really three great prophets that overlap during this time period. But Ezekiel was a prophet. He was also a priest, and he ministered to his countrymen as they uh, lived as captives in Babylon. He had a vision. He had several visions. He had a powerful vision in the first chapter of his book, which if you brought your Bibles, I'll invite you to turn to. If you want to follow it, I'm reading from Ezekiel chapter 1. He had a vision of God's glory while he lived among the exiles alongside a canal between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Ezekiel 1, and I'm reading right through chapter 2, verse 5. In my thirteenth year, in the fourth month on the fifth day, while I was among the exiles by the Kibar River, the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. On the fifth of the month, it was the fifth year of the exile of King Jehoiakim, the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzi, by the Kibar River in the land of the Babylonians. There the hand of the Lord was on him. <clears throat> now, if you have a ceiling of the Sistine Chapel a picture of God the Father in your head, erase that. This is what Ezekiel saw. He saw... God upon his holy throne. I looked, verse 4, and I saw a windstorm coming out of the north, an immense cloud with flashing lightning and surrounded by brilliant light. The center of the fire looked like glowing metal, and in the fire was what looked like four living creatures. In appearance, their form was human, but each of them had four faces and four wings. Their legs were straight, Their feet were like those of a calf and gleamed like burnished bronze. Under their wings, on their four sides, they had human hands. All four of them had faces and wings, and the wings of one touched the wings of another. Each one went straight ahead. They did not turn as they moved. Their faces looked like this. Each of the four had the face of a human, And on the right side, each had the face of a lion. And on the left, the face of an ox. Each also had the face of an eagle. 
Such were their faces. They each had two wings spreading out upward, each wing touching that of the creature on either side, and each had two other wings covering his body. Each one went straight ahead. Wherever the spirit would go, they would go, without turning as they went. The appearance of the living creatures was like burning coals of fire, or like torches. Fire moved back and forth among the creatures. It was bright, and lightning flashed out of it. The creatures sped back and forth like flashes of lightning. As I looked at the living creatures, I saw a wheel on the ground beside each creature with its four faces. This was the appearance and structure of the wheels. They sparkled like topaz, and all four looked alike. Each appeared to be made like a wheel intersecting a wheel. As they moved, they would go in any one of the four directions the creatures faced. The wheels did not change direction as the creatures went. Their rims were high and awesome, and all four rims were full of eyes all around. When the living creatures moved, the wheels beside them moved. And when the living creatures rose from the ground, the wheels also rose. Wherever the spirit would go, they would go, and the wheels would rise along with them, because the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. When the creatures moved, they also moved. When the creatures stood still, they also stood still. And when the creatures rose from the ground, the wheels rose along with them because the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. Spread out above the heads of the living creatures was what looked like something like a vault, sparkling like crystal and awesome. Under the vault, their wings were stretched out, one toward the other, and each had two wings covering his body. When the creatures moved, I heard the sound of their wings, like the roar of rushing waters, like the voice of the Almighty, like the tumult of an army. When they stood still, they lowered their wings. Then there came a voice from above the vault, over their heads, as they stood with lowered wings. Above the vault, over their heads, was what looked like a throne of lapis lazuli. And high above the throne was a figure like that of a man. I saw that from what appeared to be his waist up, he looked like glowing metal, as if full of fire, and that from there down he looked like fire, and brilliant light surrounded him, like the appearance of a rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day, so was the radiance around him. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. When I saw it, I fell face down, and I heard the voice of one speaking. He said to me, Son of man, stand on your feet, and I will speak to you. As he spoke, the Spirit came into me and raised me to my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. He said, Son of man, I am sending you to the Israelites, to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their ancestors have been in revolt against me to this day. The people to whom I am sending you are obstinate and stubborn. Say to them, This is what the Sovereign Lord says. And whether they listen or fail to listen, for they are a rebellious people, they will know that a prophet has been among them. So, in this uh, sometimes unsettling passage of Scripture, Ezekiel envisions a windstorm coming in, coming from the north of where he is standing. It is brilliantly lit, has flashing lightning through it, and in the molten glow 
of the windstorm, Ezekiel sees four living creatures. Each living creature has four wings and four faces. Face of a man, face of a lion, face of an ox, face of an eagle. The creatures have lightning flashing back and forth, and they are moving rapidly back and forth like lightning. And something like a jewel-encrusted wheel within a wheel moves alongside of each of the living creatures, but there's no apparent need of turning because when the one on the throne apparently dictates the direction, uh, the wheels and the creatures are moving, they simply move that direction without turning. And the wheels have eyes all around the rims, and they're very, very high. The Spirit of God himself is in the center of all of this, and one that looks like a human being, but who is glowing like molten metal and a flaming fire. Rising up, descending down, moving in every direction, the creatures and their mysterious wheels move in perfect unison. There's an expanse that glows, sparkles like crystal above the creatures. And the voice of God comes from there. A throne appears above the expanse, which looks to Ezekiel like It's made of sapphire, a figure like a man sits on the throne, but this is no ordinary man. Again, his body from the waist up appears to look like glowing metal and like fire from the waist down. Compare this vision to to Revelation chapter 1. What John saw, when John saw Jesus Christ in his glory. The radiance all around him is as a brilliant rainbow of light bursting forth from the clouds after a rain. And appropriately, Ezekiel and John do the same thing. They fall prostrate at God's feet. And God lifts them up and gives them instructions to minister Ezekiel is instructed in uh, the few short verses of chapter 2 that he will preach to Israel, who has been rebellious and obstinate. That's why they're in Babylon in the first place, as captives, because they've been sinning against their God and they haven't been following his law. And Ezekiel is told that he will be instructed to speak to them. And uh, he's further instructed that they won't listen to him. But he's also told that he will have, uh, that they'll be very hard and they'll steal their minds and their hearts against him, but he'll be equal to the task because God will put within him the capacity to withstand that rebellion. The Spirit of the God who sat on the throne literally lifts Ezekiel to his feet and enters into him with power, and, he, and Ezekiel is given the call to serve. God's people who are guests of Nebuchadnezzar for 70 years while uh, God is bringing uh, punishment to them because of their sin. In chapter 3, God gave Ezekiel his own words to speak to Israel. And there, uh, Ezekiel is just full of strange things. And Ezekiel sees a hand holding out a scroll And God tells him to eat it, and he eats it, and the taste is sweet, and he is taking God's very words into him so that he can warn the Israelites uh, about their sin. But God again tells Ezekiel that he'll make Ezekiel every bit as tough uh, as the opposition that's going to come against him. Then Ezekiel, hearing the wings of the creatures and the rumbling of the wheels, is transported up and away to his first assignment. Now the power of the vision and experience caused Ezekiel to remain silent among his people, overwhelmed for seven days. For seven days he couldn't speak. 
because this vision is so awesome and so overwhelming. He's stunned into silence. This isn't the last time Ezekiel will have this vision. In in a couple of chapters, he'll have the vision all over again because he'll say, I had another vision like to the first vision and he has many other very strange uh, visions. Uh, Ezekiel is the book where there's a valley of dry bones and the bones come together. And there's a great clicking sound as the bones come together and flesh comes on them and, and uh, muscle and so on. And they stand upright and they're living. God gives Ezekiel some remarkable visions. Going back to uh, the week of Passion, we always celebrate Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. He appears to everyone on that parade route to be a humble man riding on a donkey to the praise of his disciples. Join me in this thought, please. Jesus is and was God in the flesh. Everything that is God was in Jesus. The person that the disciples saw, the persons that the Pharisees and scribes hated, the person that people cried out and sang Hosanna about, was God who came in the flesh. So the people that loved Him were loving God. The people that hated Him were hating God. The people that were jealous of Him were jealous of God. Why? Because the fundamental sin we all have is we want to be God. That's at the basis of everything. That's the first sin. That's why Satan was removed from heaven and a third of his angels with him according to Revelation chapter 12. It is because he wanted to be God. It's why you and I want our own way. It's why when someone says, we'll do it this way, we say, no, I'd rather do it that way. Why? It's because we want control. We want to be God. And there are people that simply would not accept Jesus' message because He wants to be the Lord of their life. And He still does. You and I get that. We struggle all our lives with allowing Jesus to be Lord of our lives, don't we? It's a struggle every day. But that's what He wants. He's Lord of our lives. We at least acknowledge it even if we don't always behave like we acknowledge it. But the reason that people are so contrary to Christianity is that Christ is at the center of it and Christ demands to be Lord of their life. Jesus is and was God in the flesh. He was everything that God was that filled the universe with all of the power that God has. That same God that we see in this unsettling vision in Ezekiel 1 is a picture of who Jesus is. He's God in the flesh. And He made all of the throne and the cherubim and seraphim and the smoke and the rainbows and the sapphire throne. All of that disappeared as he came to minister and be one of us. And that is the miracle of the Incarnation, and that is the blessing of the Christian faith. God loved me. God loved you. Enough to set aside his godness and become a person who could be grabbed a hold of by temple police and hauled off to Pilate and turned over to Roman soldiers and nailed to a cross. He is the God who was transformed before the eyes of Peter, James, and John in 
Matthew 17, Mark 9, and this uh, passage in Luke, Luke 9. Uh, let me just read this uh, familiar passage to you. Luke 9, verses 28 through 36. About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James with him and went up to a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy. When they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. As the men were leaving Jerusalem, Peter said to him, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what he was saying. While he was speaking, a cloud appeared and covered them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept this to themselves and did not tell anyone at that time uh, what they had seen. Here's the point. I believe that God wants us, each of us, to have a high and powerful sense of who he is. It is without question that he wants us to raise our comprehension of him. We can have a greater daily level of faith in him and what he will do if we begin to grasp how high and how powerful he is. He did come as a man. He did allow himself to be nailed to a cross. He did physically and literally suffer and die for me as an act of love. But he also ascended into heaven after he was raised from the dead. And he has all power and all glory and he shares it with his Father who rules his universe. And we live in a very troubled time, and there are all kinds of voices for all kinds of evils coming our way every single day. We are bombarded with them. There is a constant Blather is the only word that comes to my mind. Of voices that speak this and speak that. And all purport to have wisdom. And where that comes from is Satan himself who wants to be God. Who wants to convince Eve and Adam they don't have to listen to God because God doesn't know what he's talking about. And they can be gods if they just eat that fruit. And we face that challenge every day of our lives. The whole human race does. And even as Christians, uh, we keep being drawn back to that choice. Knowing that the God of glory and power informs how we live uh, God wants us to raise our comprehensions. If our comprehensions of who he is are raised, that informs us how we pray. It informs the depth of spiritual experience we seek. It informs how high our expectations rise in regard to his work in our families, our church, our community, and our world, and all of their respective futures. God wants us to see him as the Lord of glory because only the God of glory can be capable 
and effectual in saving the world you and I live in and saving us from our sins and saving us from uh, the disaster unfolding all around us. We live in a world with desperate set of very large problems, but we have a very big and powerful and awesome God. And the beauty of the church and why God wants us to gather together is because we come together and we remind ourselves of who we are. We are the God followers. We follow God who has given us the Son and put the Spirit within us. And He is bigger than anything we face, for sure, and anything the world is troubled with, for certain. And every once in a while, Ezekiel 1, later on in Ezekiel, uh, in the Gospels, in Revelation chapter 1, God opens a window just far enough for us to get a glimpse of God in His glory. So, I've never seen a flannel graph picture of Ezekiel 1. Have you? Let's remember, God is amazing. God is beyond comprehension. He's the God we serve through his son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for being here on a hot Sunday in which you can hardly breathe through your masks. It's worth it for us to gather because God is here. I invite you to stand and join me. Take your insert for the closing hymn, How Great Thou Art, and the benediction. God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art, how great thou art. When through the woods and forest glades I wander and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees, when I look down from lofty mountain grandeur and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. And
And when I think that God, his son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, My God, how great Thou art! Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Father, as we prepare to go, I pray you take us in safety. Give us this week a week of peace and of power and of a sense of your poured out grace and wisdom to speak and to think and wisdom to behave as the Christ followers we are. We pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. God bless you.